Welcome back to Next Gen News, everyone. I'm Trenton. And I'm Giovanna. And, and this, this is, is Next Gen, Gen News. News. We're excited to bring you our last newscast of 2020. What a year. From COVID-19 to election recounts to endless family game nights, can't say I'll be sad to see this year go. Me neither. So long, dumpster fire of 2020. As 2020 comes to an end, the holidays are fast approaching. For our top story, let's take a look at how COVID-19 is affecting the holiday season this year. Hey Trenton, what's your favorite holiday tradition? Well, every Christmas Eve, my mom hosts a big brunch for our friends and family. Everyone brings donations such as clothes and food. Then we make about 200 bags for all the homeless and we pass them out on Skid Row in Los Angeles. But because of COVID this year, we'll only be able to do immediate family to pass out donations, which is kind of a bummer, but I'm still looking forward to giving back. How about you, Giovanna? Well, my mom's side of the family is Italian, so each year we celebrate the Feast of Seven Fishes. Mm. Our friends and family come over, and just like it's called, we eat seven different kinds of seafood. My favorite is my grandma's steamed clams. This year, only my immediate family will be feasting, but more food for us, I guess. Well, things aren't only different with our holiday traditions this year. The entire world is having to adapt this holiday season because of COVID-19. Today, let's take a trip around the world to see how different countries are celebrating this year. For our first stop today, let's head to Germany, where holiday markets are an important tradition. This year, with the lockdown, crowded markets are off the table, but one German shopkeeper has come up with a creative alternative, a holiday drive through market. Let's take a look. It wouldn't be Christmas in Germany without a festive market, and one Bavarian innkeeper has decided the show must go on. Coming up with a novel way to make sure locals still get their holiday fix despite the country's partial lockdown. The organizer, Patrick Schmidt, says the drive through Christmas market northeast of Munich is about much more than just food. What's important to me is that picking up food like here in a drive in has to be an experience. We don't just sell a crepe or a pack of roasted almonds, we sell an experience. Speaking of drive throughs, our next stop is the Netherlands. In this European country, visiting St. Nicholas looks a bit different this year. Instead of sitting on Santa's lap, children get to visit via drive through Yes, think of a Taco Bell drive through but instead less tacos and more talking. Using microphones and friendly waves, Santa Claus and his helpers are able to spread cheer from a safe distance. Speaking of visiting Santa, technology company Storyfile has come up with a virtual way to visit Santa. They have created an interactive website where Father Christmas answers questions as if it was in person. Let's take a look. Ho, 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 ho! Merry Christmas and welcome to Ask Santa. Am I on the naughty list? I think I might have answered that question before. The Ask Santa database has about 180, 100, 200 questions, um, so they can ask him quite a lot. The number one question so far is, am I on the naughty or nice list? Of course. This whole concept is, is amazing. And what better way for a child to be able to interact with Santa in such a challenging time, for, for any length of time, um, in the comfort of their own home? Seems like Santa can be seen from afar or virtually this year. But now, let's head to Hungary where Santa is a delicious treat that is also staying protected from COVID-19 with a mask made out of marzipan. Yes, you heard me right, marzipan. When Hungarian confectionist Laszlo Ramosi decided to put marzipan mask on his chocolate Santas, it was meant as a lighthearted joke. Now, he can hardly keep up as online orders have surged. That sounds delicious. For our final stop today, let's travel to Israel, where Santa Claus has made an appearance in the Dead Sea, complete with a tree. Here he is now to wish us happy holidays. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Merry Christmas from the Dead Sea. I wish you health and safety with this crazy situation.
From drive throughs to virtual hangouts to marzipan masks, the holidays will certainly be different this year. We encourage you to get creative with your family. How can you adapt your holiday traditions to be COVID friendly? What new traditions can you start? I, for one, can't wait to pass out donations to the homeless. After all, it is the season of giving. Lately, we've heard a lot about the collaboration between NASA and SpaceX. Their latest quest is to land the first woman and next man on the moon by 2024 through their Artemis program. This is in hopes to set the stage for a manned mission to Mars. Wait, like that old Disneyland ride mission to Mars that was really rocket to the moon before it was called Mission to Mars? Uh, I think that was a little before our time, but this is a bit different. Well, Giovanna, you know the U.S. is not the only space exploration in the game. Really? Yep. Let's take a look at what China has been up to recently as well. China on Tuesday launched an unmanned spacecraft to a previously untouched part of the moon to bring lunar rocks back to Earth. The mission of the Chang'e 5 probe, named after the ancient Chinese goddess of the moon, is to collect four and a half pounds of samples to help scientists understand more about the moon's origins and formation. If successful, it would make China only the third country to have retrieved lunar samples after the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Wait, I'm not sure I know about the Soviet Union and what it has to do with space. Do you know? Hmm. This sounds like the perfect time to hand it off to Oscar for some next-gen science. You know, for the space part of it. Hey guys, it's Oscar here with some next-gen science. Well, kind of history, but some science for you too. Let's start with today and work our way back to the future. Like Trenton showed us, China has recently launched a spacecraft to the moon. Let's learn more about that mission. In one lunar day, or about two weeks here on Earth, China will try to collect the material from an unvisited area in a massive lava plain on the moon. The samples will then be transferred to a return capsule and sent back to Earth. China's current mission comes as NASA is planning to send robotic rovers to the moon before an eventual human landing for the first time since 1972. Beautiful, just beautiful. Wait, wait, wait. We're going to have to go back further than 1972. And we have to understand that the Soviet Union, or the USSR, was actually the country of Russia, plus 14 other republics, and was one of the most dominant political powers in the world. You can say that the United States and the Soviet Union were rivals, competing in something called the Cold War. Not an actual war between two countries, but you could definitely cut the tension between these two global powers with a knife. So, let's go to October 4th, 1957. This date marks the Soviet launch of the Sputnik 1, the first ever satellite in space. And so the space race began. This left the U.S. in shock. Like, when you're with your parents and someone swoops a prime parking spot right in front of you. So, the Soviets continued to have success launching satellites and missiles. Meanwhile, the first satellite that the U.S. tried to launch, the Vanguard, ended up exploding instead of ascending. So there's that. Throughout the following decade, the US was constantly trying to keep up with the Soviets. They developed NASA, dedicated tons of money to develop space exploration, and even sent chimpanzees to space to test spacecrafts. Pretty bananas right now. Events on both sides contributed to the turning point in this race. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy made a strong public declaration that the U.S. would land a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Meanwhile, in 1966, Sergei Korolev, the chief engineer of the Soviet space program, surprisingly died, weakening the abilities of their program. The U.S. ramped up their Apollo program, and on July 16, 1969, the world saw the launch of Apollo 11, making Neil Armstrong the first man to ever walk on the surface of the moon. This massive accomplishment seemingly made the U.S. the winner of the space race. At this point, the Cold War began to thaw, referred to as the Taunt. And in 1975, U.S. and Soviet astronauts coordinated on a meeting in space, shaking hands, exchanging gifts, and collaborating on experiments. Overall, we've been trying to explore space for over 60 years. Now, the space race has been redefined with new competitors and a new goal 
Who will put the first human on planet Mars? Will it be China, Russia, the United States? Only time will tell who will win Space Race 2.0 and reach this new frontier. Well, I'm Oscar, and this has been some out of this world next gen science. Hey Trenton, when you're older and retired, what kind of life do you want to have? Well, I myself can't wait to be retired. Wake up every day, do the New York Times crossword puzzle, take the dog for a walk, meet some retired friends for brunch and backgammon. Hmm, the life. Would you ever see your retired self wanting to, I don't know, sail around the world? Oh, heck no. Why do you ask? Well, this next story will sure shock you then. Meet 80-year-old author and sailor Jimmy Cornell. On November 19th, 2020, he set sail from Sevilla, Spain to circle the globe on a zero emissions electric catamaran. At this point, you might be wondering why Cornell is sailing 32,000 miles around the Earth, and the answer is rather historical. He's honoring the 500th anniversary of explorer Ferdinand Magellan's famous expedition, which was the first to circumnavigate the globe. Whoa, Spain retirement sailing around the globe is pretty remarkable. And so is the first person to circumnavigate the globe 500 years ago. Ferdinand Magellan is the man. Well, actually, Ferdinand Magellan himself did not circle the entire globe. Magellan's story is like a roller coaster at Six Flags. Lots of up and downs and even some vomiting. Let's now head to Oscar to learn more about Ferdinand Magellan in this week's edition of Next Gen History. Hey Next Gen viewers, Oscar here with a bit of Next Gen History. Today, we are going to travel back in time. Over 500 years to meet one of my favorite European explorers, Ferdinand Magellan. Little Ferdinand is said to have been born in Sabrosa, Portugal in 1480. Born to Portuguese nobility, Magellan had quite the bougie childhood and served as a page to Queen Lenora. From a young age, Magellan was intrigued by the fame and riches of exploration, and he began studying astronomy and navigation. Soon enough, he began participating in Portuguese expeditions to places such as India and Morocco. But Participating wasn't enough. Magellan wanted more. And what he wanted was fame and spices. Yes, you heard me right. Spices. In the 15th century, spices such as cinnamon, nutmeg, and black pepper were extremely valuable and the most important commodity in the world. These spices weren't grown in Europe, but instead in the Moluccas or present-day Indonesia. Europeans had reached the Moluccas or Spice Islands by going east, but no one had found a western route to them. And this is where our friend Ferdinand Magellan comes in and our roller coaster of a story begins. In 1517, Ferdinand Magellan first approached King Manuel of Portugal to support his western expedition to the Spice Islands, but the king repeatedly denied his petition. Not taking no for an answer, Magellan crossed the border and approached King Charles I of Spain, the same royal family that had funded Christopher Columbus's expedition in 1492. Although Magellan was Portuguese, the voyage was approved, and Magellan was feeling on top of the world. He departed Spain in 1519 with five ships and 270 crew members, most of which were of Spanish descent. After heading west and crossing the Atlantic Ocean, Searching for a passage through South America, the expedition stopped at Port St. Julian in Argentina, sending one ship on ahead to scout. And this is where our roller coaster of a story takes a sudden turn. While stopped at the port, the Spanish captains of the crew carried out a mutiny, or tried to overthrow and kill Ferdinand Magellan, the Portuguese commander. Eye on the prize as always, Magellan stopped the mutiny killed one of the mutinous captains and left the other ashore in St. Julian. Meanwhile, the ship sent ahead to scout got shipwrecked. But luckily, the crew survived and joined the other ship, Christ averted, for the moment. As the crew ambled on, they finally found the passageway through South America, now called the Strait of Magellan. After a month navigating the treacherous passageway full of seasick sailors, in November 1520, they emerged with a vast ocean before them. 
They were the first Europeans to ever reach this massive ocean. Magellan named it Mar Pacifico, or Peaceful Sea. Ironic, given it's not peaceful. But nonetheless, it is now, of course, known as the Pacific Ocean. Magellan was back on top after discovering the Pacific Ocean, but this feeling did not last long. As they continued west, the crew got scurvy, ran out of food, and they resorted to eating leather. Yuck! Sounds like rock bottom to me. After almost 100 days without fresh food, the ships finally reached land in March 1521. In Guam, land ho! After replenishing, Magellan's fleet sailed to the island of Cebu in the Philippines. Magellan befriended the locals and was closer than ever to reaching his dream of finding a western route to the Spice Islands. Feeling on top of the world again, Magellan agreed to fight alongside the Cebu locals in their battle against the neighboring island of Mactan. During the battle, Magellan was shot with a poison arrow and then full on attacked by the Mactans. Our pal, Ferdinand Magellan, died on April 27, 1521. You may be thinking our story is over and the credits are about to roll. But think again! With one ship left intact, fleet navigator Juan Sebastian Ocano took a chance and continued westward with the remaining crew. Ocano finally made it to the Malaccas. And boy did he load up on spices, cinnamon, nutmeg, and black pepper galore with a ship full of spices, but only 17 original crew members left of the 270 that started the journey. El Cano continued west all the way back to Spain on September 8th, 1522, approximately three years after starting the expedition, they had completed the first circumnavigation of the globe. Although Magellan did not live to see the end of his road coaster of a voyage, his planned expedition led to the discovery of the Pacific Ocean, a westward route to the Spice Islands in Indonesia, and the first circumnavigation of the globe. And that's the story of Ferdinand Magellan. Thanks for tuning in to Next Gen History. So speaking of traveling around the world, Giovanna, have you heard of the latest social media influencer to come out of Rome, Italy? Um, I'm just trying to keep track of finishing up my school assignments for the year, so I think you're going to have to help me out a bit. Okay, well, get ready for a surprising story about a little boy living his best life despite life's many challenges. At a glance, he may look like any other seven-year-old playing in his neighborhood, but Sirio Persichetti is far from it. Sirio has spastic tetraplegia, which is a form of cerebral palsy that affects his ability to move various limbs in his body. His mouth is permanently open so he cannot properly speak, feed himself, or even swallow food. For these reasons, he is fed nutrition through a feeding tube in his stomach and had a tracheotomy to assist him with breathing. Despite these challenges, Sirio's resilience and excitement for life has inspired his mother, Valentina, to share his world with others via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and even their own website. Let's hear about her reasons for sharing such a personal story in such a public way. We wanted to tell the story of disability in a different way, to tell it for what it is, something that's not easy to face, but that if channeled into the right direction with the right help, it can allow these children to enjoy something that can actually be called life. Wow, that's really inspiring. I'm sure there can be a lot of judgment or negativity that people put out there when children are seen as different than others. That's exactly one of the reasons why Sirio's mom is doing this. On his social media accounts, she posts pictures and videos of Sirio doing all the regular things kids his age would do, like interacting with his older brother or even just walking to the park. For us, it's not an issue, but Sirio was able to defy the odds and now walk with the help of leg braces. These type of videos and pictures help people get a better understanding of what it's like to live with a child with disabilities and also has an impact on those facing similar circumstances. Let's have a listen. I must say that in a short time, the response, especially from families living in similar situations, was powerful and exciting, so we decided to keep going. We understood that it's absolutely necessary to talk about disability without any pity, without the usual ways that disability is narrated. 
So Trenton, would you consider Serio to be a next-gen person to watch? Absolutely. This kid has touched the hearts of people all over the world and is a reminder about how important inclusion is for children and adults with disabilities. Well, if you want to brush up on your Italian, you can see more of Serio and his family on Instagram by searching at Tatrabondi and learn more about how to help children with disabilities. Go to unicefusa.org and search disabilities. And here's to Serio Persichetti for being this week's person to watch. Well, Next Gen viewers, that about wraps up our show for today. We hope you have a wonderful and safe holiday season. We will see you in 2021. For now, I'm Trenton. And I'm Giovanna. And, and we, we are Next, Next Gen, Gen News. News. Bringing news to the next generation.